Marine for that music. Our scripture this morning <clears throat> is a well-known verse found in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Philippians 4, verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. We'll now turn the time over to Frank. Thank you. Thank you for the everyone who participated this morning. The, the special music was wonderful. I'll have you turn in your Bibles to um, Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. We've had a pretty busy week last Sabbath. My wife and I were at the um, Ukrainian-Russian camp meeting north of Spokane. We got to speak four times there, and my wife got to share quite a bit of her own story with some people who had questions. And so the very next day, we were at the Ark of Peace, uh, no man's land between Canada and America, where uh, some of our girls uh, celebrated their um, what do you, a graduation. <laughs> yeah. The next day, I became an American citizen. And the next day, I've been speaking in Ukraine twice a day for two hours every day, and uh, this afternoon as well. And so... The Lord, in spite of my retire, supposed retirement, um, ha has me working anyway. <laughs> and I get to speak the Word of God here this morning as well. This morning, we, we studied the Sabbath school lesson together in that room next door. I haven't had the time to study the Sabbath school lesson this week. And it's amazing how much of my material um, uh, Nick Jr., Nick Sr. stole from me. But anyway, <laughs> here it is. We're in Revelation chapter 12, and we're going to look at verse 9, which we did look at in, the, in our Sabbath school room as well. Revelation 12, verse 9. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So according to the verse here, what is Satan's objective? Can someone tell me? Yeah, that's his plan to deceive the whole world. Now, why would he want to do that? Well, because deception is based on lies and lies, lies lead to bad decisions and bad decisions lead, lead to negative consequences. And so, obviously, you and I are adopting the truth, right? In every aspect of life, in spite of the fact that the Bible says our hearts are deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, we want the truth, don't we? Well, I do, in any case. When I first opened the Bible, I suppose you've heard this from me before, then, but uh, when I first opened the Bible, this was a long time ago, like uh, 50 years ago, I told the Lord I didn't care. I was going to read the Bible. He could teach me there whatever he wanted. I would not go to the priest. I would not go to Jehovah Witness. I would not go anywhere else to find anyone who would interpret the word of God for me. Because I didn't trust anyone. Too much lies in this world. Lots of lies, of course. So I asked the Lord to guide me. And he began teaching me the Sabbath, the state of the dead, tithing, the spirit of prophecy, all kinds of stuff. And do you know when he finally put me into the Seventh-day Adventist church, I did not have to change anything that he had taught me along the way. And so I have proof that God will teach us. And so if we base our decisions on truth, then instead of the circumstances being negative, um, then the blessings come. That's what it's all about. I'd like to have you turn with me to Genesis chapter 3, which we did speak about as well um, this morning in our Sabbath school lesson. Genesis chapter 3, we're looking at deceptions, of course. 
We're going to read verses 1 to 4 in Genesis chapter 3. And the serpent, serpent was more subtle than any beast in the, of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, has God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said to the woman, Ye shall not surely die. And what was that? That was a lie. Yeah. In John 8, verse 44, you don't have to turn there. Jesus accused the Pharisees of being of their father, the devil, who abides in lies, and, and he is a liar from the beginning. And so this is the beginning. This is where we were reading the beginning of lies in this world. Okay? Actually, if you think about it, a lie boils down to just a thought. Right? Satan put a thought in her mind. He lied to her. No doubt it was in form of a thought. And she did not have to believe the thought. She did not have to receive the thought. She could as well reject it because she had the proof from God himself that the truth was they were not to eat from that tree. However, we know what happened. Eve began to ponder what the serpent had said. After all, not very often that you see a serpent speaking. I've never heard one, except for what I get in my ears sometime from Satan. Anyway, she pondered in her mind. I can just imagine, could that be true? Yeah. To reinforce his suggestions, of course, Satan went on. He added this in verse 5. This is Genesis 3, verse 5. For God does know that in the day that you eat thereof, your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and, and evil. Eve had everything. When God created the Garden of Eden, there was no sin. There was no reason for anyone to lack anything. They had absolutely everything they could possibly have, except one thing. She was not a god, and she did not know good and evil. And to her, somehow, in her mind, it seemed to be somewhat attractive. We see that in verse 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and the tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat as well. So there we have it. Over one thought, Adam and Eve threw the whole human race under the bus. One thought. Then Satan goes over unto God and he says to God, listen, you said that if they ever ate from that tree, they would die. So, do it. <laughs> and then Satan goes over back to Adam and Eve and from then on he harasses them with guilt and shame and sorrow and extreme pain and self-recrimination on and on and on. And friends, he has been doing that since then up until this day with every human being that exists. He has managed somehow because of our fallen nature to lead us into sin and with sin comes shame and guilt and self-recrimination and all of these things that go with it. Now in order to be able to fix this trouble that we are in, we focus on fixing the sin. This is what we want to do. If my father is an alcoholic, then I work on, let's work on his alcoholism to see if we can't make him quit. If my friend is a drug addict, let's work on getting him to a rehab so that he can get rid of this problem. Al uh, drug addiction. Are you into porn? There must be a five-step program somewhere that can deal with that. Have, are, do you have an eating disorder? Let's work on the eating disorder. All along, we miss the root cause. Now, you might tell by now that I've been reading a book by Paul, Paul Conniff, I hear that he spoke here before, and he probably spoke on this very subject. In any case, from the book that Paul Conniff wrote, I read, I read and I wrote this, bad behavior is only the fruit and not the root of the issue. 
behind all our sorrows, behind all our guilt and shame and despair, behind the fear that Satan has put in our hearts, Satan continues to put on us subtle suggestions. Let me illustrate if I can. The Bible says that Mary Magdalene was possessed of seven demons. And with that, of course, she became a prostitute. But there is something in that story that is hard to, to uh, account for. I mean, it, it's hard to know why she ended up the way she ended up. I mean, after all, she was born in a very good family. Lazarus, her brother, was a very good friend of Jesus. Martha was known for her servanthood. She was a very great servant. And I, uh, you know, I think of their parents. They must have been good parents, Sabbath keepers. They went to synagogue every Sabbath. And it was a good family. But what happened to Mary Magdalene? Do we know? Well, I don't know if you know. Uh, but we do know that Uncle Simon, the Pharisee, the pastor over there in the family... He's what happened to her. In the book Desire of Ages 566, paragraph 5, Simon had led into sin the woman he now despised. Now this is a reference to a, to a feast that Simon had invited Jesus and Lazarus to come for, to come to. And so Lazarus and Jesus are at the feast. Martha is the servant. Mary Magdalene was not invited. Simon did not want to have Mary Magdalene invited, but she shows up anyway. She's got a, a casket there of spicknard, and, and um, she's pouring some of that perfume on Jesus' head and on his feet, and she's using her hair to, to dry his feet, and Judas is all upset. He's having a bird of all this because 300 denarii, that's a lot of money. That's a year's wages. And it could have gone into the bag so they could serve the poor. Well, she never intended to serve the poor. He held the bag. He was the accountant in the company. And he was helping himself to the money with all kinds of reasons of why he could. Okay. Well, when Judas was complaining like this, Simon took up the complaint and thought to himself as well, if Jesus knew who this woman is, he wouldn't allow her to touch him. Yeah, let me read the quotation in full now. Simon had led into sin the woman he now despised. She had been deeply wronged by him, dot, dot, dot. His sin was greater than hers. She was a prostitute. He was a pastor. He was forgiven. She was forgiven. But his sin was greater than hers. What was her big sin anyway? It doesn't say in the text, as far as I know. I assume we're talking about the prostitution part. Who knows? And who led her there? Her uncle Simon. Now, how did he do that? Well, friends, the story doesn't say. <clears throat> but it isn't too hard to deduce, is it? My brain says that he sexually exploited her. Now, Lord, forgive me if I, if I miss the boat here. But that seems to imply, to be implied throughout of what, everything I read. And so he sexually exploited her. I don't know how young she was, but he was her uncle. She probably looked up to him. He was a pastor after all, or was going to be a pastor, whatever it might be. And um, she probably expected a lot more from him. He could have been a huge positive influence in her life and led her heavenward. But no, he did the opposite somehow. Now, here's the question. Why should what he did destroy her life? She didn't sin. He did. She was just an innocent victim. And he was the perpetrator. It's amazing to me. And probably we've all heard this happening before. But ladies who are raped eventually end up thinking they were to blame. Were they to blame? Why do they go thinking that way? Who is it that puts that thought in her or their heads? Where do these thoughts originate? Do thoughts come out of thin air? Do you want to think about everything that comes to your mind? Uh, how many things come to your mind, by the way? Do you know that Satan has the power to speak to us? And it, well, the funny thing about it is, very often, and we're told that, 
uh, in the spirit of prophecy, that Satan speaks to us in the first person. In other words, when he's finished talking to us, it's as if we've heard ourselves tell ourselves what he said. It's an amazing magic trick of some kind, right? Yeah. So Mary thought to herself, there must be a reason he did what he did. He treated me like a harlot. Do you think? Could it be? And then from that moment on, Satan harassed her with doubt and with fear and with despair and with depression and guilt and who knows what not. And she began to entertain the doubt. And it led her astray because she was bad. We're all bad, by the way. Yeah. That I may know him, page 137. One accustoms himself or herself to assert certain things in regard to himself or herself. And at last, he or she comes to believe them. Our thoughts produce our words and our words react on our thoughts. So Satan comes, he speaks to our ear, we hear it, hear it in the first person, and we believe it. And the more we repeat it, the more we believe it, and our thoughts react on our words and actions. And we end up acting like Satan wants us to. Terrible thing, really, if we're not careful what we do with our thoughts. I have a friend, a very close friend, his father was a shipping tycoon here in the United States. He grew up uh, during the hippie era. Well, I grew up during the hippie era, but I was never a hippie. He was. He uh, come uh, from a very wealthy family. And so his father put him in school, Harvard, and all the rest. But he was against the establishment being a hippie, and he didn't stay in school. He just went off and became a hippie. He ended up with a group of other hippies in Africa where they grew a pile of marijuana, and then they smuggled it into the United States and made huge amounts of money. Now, the hippie movement came with free love. Wonderful. Well, not so much. Eventually, there was a threesome. My friend, another fellow, and a girl. She became like the wife of two husbands in the fact that, you know, free love is so wonderful, they could share her that way. And um, the problem is that some years later, not too many years later, my friend married the girl. They became Seventh-day Adventists by and by. He served as a pastor for several years, and now he's a very successful businessman. For nearly 50 years, Satan has tortured my friend with a thought. I don't know exactly what the thought is, but I've heard him speak many times, and I've known him for 40 years, and for the last 20, 15, 10 years, whatever it is, almost every time he speaks, he speaks of the torture that he experiences emotionally in his heart. <clears throat> because of what they did when they were young. And I don't know what he's talking about exactly. Uh, maybe it's the relationship between his wife and the other fellow, jealousy, I have no idea what it is, but he is tortured. And just a few weeks ago, I was in, um, in Colombia and he was there as well. He's the, I'm not gonna tell you who he is, sorry. Phew, that came close, I didn't wanna do that. <laughs> Anyways, even there, I heard him say again, he had done something to try and get rid of the torture. And then I heard him say just the other day, he was talking to someone else. He says, I am still just torn apart by what happened. Don't know exactly what it is. Yeah. That was many years ago. And you have to understand that many years ago, that episode, the, that episode is past. All that's left is the thought. If he lost his memory, he wouldn't be tortured at all. If Satan quit reminding him every few days or whatever it might be, he could be free from this thing. Does Satan ever remind you of something that you wish you could forget? He does that kind of thing. In Mind, Character, and Personality, page 432, paragraph 2. 
There are thoughts and feelings suggested and aroused by Satan that annoy even the best of men. And I consider my friend one of the best of men. I've never known anyone quite as loving. Oh, he has a lot of hippie ways in him. Maybe that's, I don't know if that's why. But anyway, yeah, he is really a loving individual. Yeah. There is an antidote, an antidote to all of this poison. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 63. Isaiah chapter 63. And we're going to look at verse 9 in Isaiah 63. And I believe this is the antidote. Verse 9. In all their affliction, he was afflicted. This is talking about Jesus, his relationship to Israel, of course, because there were no Christians at that time, but they were the Christians of the day. In all their affliction, he was afflicted. And the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them. And he bare them and carried them all the days of old. And I'm hoping that you can see in this verse that Jesus feels what we feel. Can you see that? Yeah. And it awakens, if you look at the verse carefully, it awakens pity and love in his heart. And with pity and love comes the idea, I am going to work to redeem them and to save them. This is what is in God's head. This is what is in God's heart and in Jesus' heart. We sometimes think because we have sinned that vengeance is what is in his heart or that he, he needs to punish us or he punishes us because we've done this and that and the other thing. But friends, it's not that way. God loves us and everything we feel, he feels. He is definitely sorry and, and I should say sorrowed because we fall into sin. Because he knows how much it's going to hurt us. And he knows also what Satan is going to do about it. And we're going to be harassed with guilt and sorrow and pain and all the rest that goes with that. Does Jesus accuse anyone? No. The devil is the accuser of the brethren. Jesus forgives. Now, obviously, everyone's not going to be in the kingdom of heaven, even though Jesus has provided forgiveness for all. Not everyone wants it. Yeah. So what then do we do with sin? What then do we do with these memories and these suggestions? Ah, friends, listen, the day is coming when Jesus will blot these episodes out of his own mind. He's going to blot these episodes and cleanse the record books of heaven totally of it. He will cleanse my friend's mind of that record as well. There will be no remembrance. The Bible says it very clearly that there will be no remembrance of all that that breaks our hearts today. And makes us feel so bad and so guilty and so dirty and all the rest. So do we have to entertain every thought that Satan brings to our mind until that day when they're blotted out? I don't think so. Yeah. I have to confess, I have many regrets. My mouth opens and talks before I think uh, many times. I, I hope it was worse in the past than it is now. Satan often works to remind me. I might be walking down the street. I don't, you know, my mind might be on nothing but the flowers and the trees and whatever I'm seeing at the time. And then suddenly there's a thought in my mind. And I can tell you when it happens, I, I shake my head. I just shake my head. I don't want to think those thoughts. I refuse to, to dwell on what Satan is trying to get me to dwell on. I don't want my life to be defined by my past. I don't want my life to be defined by Satan's suggestions, what people think of me, or what I think people think of me. Go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And we're looking at verse 5 in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Getting close. Verse 5. This is a um, promise that I claim immediately when a thought comes to my brain that I do not want to dwell on. Verse 10, verse 5 rather. 
2 Corinthians 10, verse 5, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and brings into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. I'm determined that my life will be defined by what we find in the book of Ephesians chapter 1. Go to the book of Ephesians chapter 1. It's not far from 2 Corinthians. Just keep going past Galatians. And there's the book of Ephesians chapter 1, looking at verse 2 to 6. Grace be to you and peace from our God, from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. This is God's will for you and me. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he, cho he has chosen us in him that is in Christ before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. I choose to believe that all spiritual blessings in Christ are mine. I choose to believe that I am chosen in Christ. I am without blame before him in love. I am adopted as a child of God. I am accepted in the beloved. And someone might ask, well, on what do you base all of that wonderful Foundation, Desire of Ages 113, paragraph 1. The word that was spoken to Jesus at the Jordan. So Jesus is baptized, and he comes up out of the water, and God speaks to him. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And then uh, Ellen White says, these words embraces humanity. Are you part of humanity? Do you know that these words embrace you? This is my beloved son. This is my beloved daughter in whom I am well pleased. God looks down. And when he sees us, he sees his son. This is what this is telling us. With all of our sins and weaknesses, we are not cast aside as worthless. He has made us accepted in the beloved. You and I are accepted if we have accepted, of course, the gift of his salvation, and we put ourselves in his hand, and we wish to live according to his will to the best of our ability. Now that's a thought worth remembering, don't you think? Go with me to Proverbs chapter 12, verse 5. Proverbs chapter 12. We're looking at verse 5. I finally learned how to use my Bible so it doesn't take me forever to open the page. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 5. The thoughts of the righteous are right, but the counsels of the wicked are deceit. Now, we could paraphrase this, and I do it for myself anyway. The thoughts of the righteous are true, because truth is right, but the counsels of the wicked are deceit. They are lies. That's what that's all about. Okay, Proverbs 23, verse 7. Everyone is familiar with this pretty well, I would think. Proverbs 23, and we're looking at verse 7. Yeah. I said I got used to my Bible. I was lying. <laughs> <laughs> Proverbs 23, verse 7. For he, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. The thoughts we allow ourselves to think form the man or the woman. That's all that that is saying. We are allowed to think. How many thoughts do you think we have in a day? What do you think about in a day? What do you fill your, fill your head with? in a day. And do you think that Satan is sitting on his hands? That he never has anything to say to you? Do you think every thought that you think is right? There is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof is what? Yeah. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. That's what the Bible says. And it is not in us. We need to be careful of those thoughts. 
So what thoughts then should we entertain? The Bible told us, we saw it in our scripture reading, whatsoever things is true, whatsoever things is honest, whatsoever things is pure, whatsoever things is lovely, whatsoever things is a good report. God tells us what to think. Think on these things. Don't be thinking about lies that Satan puts in your head. Christ Object Lessons, excuse me, not so, um, Councils on Health, page 295, paragraph 3. The only safety for any soul is right thinking. Now, people might say, well, I try to think right all the time. No, no, it's not that easy. We have to realize that there's an enemy out there who is trying to fill your head with deceptions beside the fact that the heart is deceitful above all things to begin with, and we live in a world of deception to begin with, right? We are surrounded with lies, and we are permeated with lies, and you can't listen to the radio, or to the internet, or the television, or people, or pastors of other churches, of course, not our pastors. Yeah. The only safety for any soul is right thinking. Education, page 146, paragraph 2. No truth does the Bible more clearly teach than dot, dot, dot. The experiences of life are the fruit of our own thoughts. There you are. What, are th what we think about is what we're going to become. Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 19 says the same thing. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 6. And we're looking at verse... 19. Jeremiah 6, verse 19. Hear, O earth, behold, I will bring evil upon this people, even the fruit of their thoughts, because they have not hearkened to my words, which is the truth, nor to my law, but rejected it. So, when people reject what is written in the word of God, by the way, the only thing that is truth in this world is in this book. That's it. And if people reject the word of God, they are rejecting truth and they are subject to lies. Yeah. And he says, I will reward them according to their what? Their thoughts. Because they want to think lies all along. And lies lead to bad decisions. And bad decisions lead to negative consequences. If we reject God's word... What then is there left to accept? Except lies. Question. How strong is Satan? What would it take to break his power over us? That's the question. Now you hold that question in your heart. Let me ask you another question. Have you ever had a thought? Now, I mentioned that a little bit earlier. How hard is it to have a thought? Why? We have a thousand thoughts every day. When I was in Africa, I could go to a village not far away, wherever it might be, and say to the African people, in about a month from now, supposing it will be July the 3rd, in July the 3rd, we're going to have a lot of clothes, uh, used clothing coming from America. You come on over and everyone that comes will receive one, two or three pairs of new clothing. Now, that's a thought. How many of those Africans do you think will forget that on July 3rd they can come to our house and get free clothing? None. They will be there and not just the ones you told either. And there will be a horde of people there. It's easy to keep a thought, don't you think? Yeah. Do you know that you can break Satan's you can break Satan with just one thought? One thought, you can destroy him. Now that's a fine thought, isn't it? <laughs> Let me read it to you. Uh, Gospel Workers 161, paragraph 1. Listen carefully. This is very important. The thought. This is, what it, this is the thought, by the way. The thought that the righteousness of Christ is imputed to us, that is given to us, not because of any merit on our part, not because of anything we can do, but as a free gift is a precious now watch. 
The enemy of God and man is not willing that this truth, this thought, should be clearly presented. For he knows that if the people fully receive it, that is this thought, his power will be broken. Wow. Would you like to be able to break Satan's power over you? One thought will do it. And this is it. And many times in the congregation, the congregation will say, well, you want to repeat that thought? Well, because you didn't ask, I will anyway. Yeah. The thought that the righteousness of Christ is imputed to us, not because of any merit on our part, but as a free gift from God, is a precious thought. And the enemy of God knows that if you fully receive it, his power is broken. I would like to suggest this morning that it would be well for us to memorize that thought. Gospel Workers 161, paragraph 1. Memorize that thought and then get on your knees. Go to God and say, God, I've memorized the thought. Doesn't seem like much to me. I don't think I can break Satan power with this. Ask God to open up to your mind what is involved in this thought. What exactly is the fullness of understanding here so that I can use this thought to destroy my enemy? What do you say? Last verse. Isaiah 55, verses 7 to 9. Isaiah 55, 7 to 9. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God and he will abundantly pardon. What do you need to do? Forsake your thoughts. Don't think your own thoughts. Verse 6, uh, that was 7 rather, verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. And all of God's thoughts are in this book. All of God's thoughts are in the spirit of prophecy. Fill your heart with these things. Yeah. And the enemy won't have the power that he thinks he has over us. Shall we?